Greetings, everyone. This is Jeff Wilkerson, professor of physics at Luther College, bringing you the next in our series of what to look for in the night sky. We're talking about the week of November 25th, this time around, almost all the way through the year, but deep into a good fall sky. We're going to focus on the morning sky. Uh, this is what you can see in the morning sky. In part, that's my bias because I see the morning sky every morning. Uh, I see the evening sky a lot. I see the overnight sky a lot. Every morning, I'm out, I'm out looking at the morning sky. Uh, we're going to talk about what you look what you can see when you look east and what you can see when you look west. Now, the stuff you see when you look west, that's been up pretty much all night, right? It was, it's rising and setting, moving across and setting in the west. And in fact, we'll talk more about this in the next week or, or two. Uh, this is a great time of year as we have a lot of dark sky. Uh, it's just not as much daylight for those of us in the north that you can see a lot of objects uh, rising in the east and setting in the west or setting in the west as it gets dark and then rising in the east before sunrise. So we're going to be talking about some of that. But what we got this time, as we look toward the west, we see Jupiter. Jupiter is the biggest, brightest object out there. Last week, we talked about Jupiter closing in on the, on the star Iota Tauri. Uh, not a super bright star. You might be able to see it with your naked eye. A pair of binoculars is going to help you. Uh, but it really closes down uh, to within a half a degree this week. Uh, so by the end of the week, Jupiter's still closing uh, in retrograde motion, uh, moving to the west against the background stars. It gets to within about a half a degree. Remember, your finger at arm's length is one degree. Uh, that's that angle. And so you say, okay, no, it's not that angle, but you, you, you see what I mean. Um, and you see that uh, it's within a half a degree of, of Iota Tauri by the end of the week. Really close, a really impressive thing to see. Uh, the big bright planet next to the fainter star there. Uh, this whole region of the sky rises about 5 p.m. So that's what I'm talking about to say. You don't have to wait till morning to see this. In fact, if you, if you want to go out any time after it gets dark, you're going to be able to see uh, Jupiter rising in the east about 5, depending on what your western eastern horizon looks like, 5, 5, 15, 5, 30. Uh, Jupiter is about 8 degrees. Your fist at arm's length is about 10 degrees, remember. And Jupiter is about 8 degrees uh, above and behind, above, and maybe to the east of Aldebaran, you go about seven and a half degrees, so about the same distance down the other direction, and you run into the Crab Nebula. This is a supernova remnant from a star that we saw blow up in the year 1054, so the star exploded as a supernova about a thousand years ago. It's, a, it's a, about as good a representative object of that type. It's about as good a supernova remnant as you're going to find for a small telescope, but still, it's, it's not great. Uh, it's a fuzzy little patch, you got a, a, an 8-inch backyard telescope, a 10-inch backyard telescope, pretty good telescope, uh, but it's going to show this as a little smudge of light, uh, typically. Uh, it depends how good your skies are. You might be able to see it uh, a little bit better, see a little more drama in it. Uh, but it makes this sort of isosceles triangle with Aldebaran and Jupiter right now. So you can use that as a guide to, to scan around and try to find it if you don't have a go-to telescope. That same 8 degrees that separates these objects, you move straight on over, and you're going to come to M35, a beautiful open star cluster. Uh, so that might help you triangulate your way to the Crab Nebula as well, because the M35 is a lot easier to see. You're going to see that in a pair of binoculars. Uh, a, a good a small telescope is going to be beautiful, uh, pretty much any small telescope you have. So we've got that. If we swing further to the south as we're looking to the west, Orion is there. Uh, you got Betelgeuse and, and, and Rigel, the big bright stars in Orion. But below and behind Orion, to the south and to the east, is Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. So you see Sirius glowing beautifully there. You move about 25 degrees up, boom, boom you've got, you got another fine bright star, Procyon. Uh, Canis Major, Canis Minor. Uh, so you've got two big bright stars. And now we've been using Castor and Pollux the last couple of weeks to find our way to Mars. We said, here's the Gemini stars, Castor, Pollux, Mars. But Mars... In, in prograde motion has been moving so hard toward cancer, toward, <clears throat> toward that beehive cluster in cancer that we talked about, that it's now a little bit easier, I think, to find Mars as the red dot of light. You go Sirius to Procyon, and not quite a straight line, but about a straight line on up, and not quite as far, but almost the same distance again, 21 degrees, and you get to Mars. So you see uh, Sirius, Procyon, Mars uh, forming a nice line in the morning sky in the west. Now, this region rises about 8.30 p.m., so again, this is something you can see pretty much all night. Go out at 9 o'clock or 9.30, and you're going to get a good view of this. Uh, Mars is, we talked a couple of weeks ago about how Mars is closing on this beautiful open star cluster. We have a good open star cluster here. The Beehive Cluster is a nice, big, bright open star cluster. you got dark skies. You can see it with your naked eye for sure. 
binoculars show it great. Uh, a small telescope will work, but it's so big that you need a really wide angle eyepiece, really low power eyepiece to see it or you lose the drama of this. You start to leak stars out of this. You spread the stars out too much. But by the end of the week, Mars is still closing in there. By the end of the week, Mars is less than two degrees away from M44. Great chance to try to get some pictures. If you got something to take pictures of, of that part of the sky, those are going to be great. Now, we swing and we look to the east to the stuff that's just coming up in the morning and to the north in the east, we've got the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper's climbing up high in the sky. It's pointed straight up with the bowl up and the handle down. And we say the handle has a, has a bend in it. My star and Alcar, the bend star right there in the handle. And it curves, arcs. And we say it arcs to Arcturus. Arcturus is this big bright star in Boethes. I've read for decades. I, I've read different articles of people talking about the color of Arcturus, saying the spectrum of Arcturus suggests it should be a pretty yellow star or a white star to us. Uh, but a lot of people say it looks kind of orangish red. And, and so you go out and see what you look like. See what you think that looks like. What Does Ar Arcturus look yellow or orange to you? And then you spin on down to the bright star Spica in the base of the Y shape of Virgo. And so Spica is a big, bright first magnitude star. And what we can do right now, if we look at the stars that are above here, so there's the, there's the cup that is the Y shape that is Virgo and the top part of Virgo. And Parima is this beautiful star that's just above Spica. It's a Spica's 1.0 magnitude. Parima is a good bright 2.7 magnitude star. So no matter, you know, I won't say no matter what your skies are, you might have really light polluted skies. Uh, but if you've got decent skies at all, you'll see these two stars. Uh, Parima, we talk about this every time we come by here because it's worth talking about. Parima is a binary star. And it's a binary star uh, that about 19 years ago, uh, the two stars were really right on top of each other, and they've been opening up ever since. And there's about three arc seconds between those stars, and this could open all the way up to six or seven arc seconds over the coming decades. So this is a great long-term project, is to, is to sketch what you see of the binary star Parima as the separation of the two stars grows uh, over the coming years. Uh, but it, 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 your small telescope that you were using to look at these objects over here will pull this apart as a fine binary star. Zaniah is a 3.9 magnitude star, and Zabi Jab is a 3.6 magnitude star up above there. The moon, on the morning of the 25th, 4 or 5 a.m., let's say 5 a.m., let's go, it depends where you are, but for me here in the middle uh, of, of North America, uh, up north in, in the middle of the United States, uh, and this, this, this would be clear at 5 a.m. of the horizon and look pretty good. The moon will be about one-third full, and it's going to scoot between Zabi Java and Zaniah, a little bit closer to Zabi Java. It's going to be a great grouping of, of objects. By the next day, it passes down below Parima on the 26th, and on the 26th, it's about 20% full. So the moon's going to be about one-fifth full, a beautiful crescent moon just below Parima. But the morning of the 27th is when the real action occurs. In the morning of the 27th, the moon is going to go right over the top of Spica for some of us. And it depends on the where you are, right, to look at this. Uh, but the moon is, go, is going to be about 10 to 15 percent full, about as beautiful a crescent moon as you can get. And for me, again, in the middle part, the north central part of the United States, for me, this is going to occur at just before 430, a couple of minutes before 430. The moon is going to blink a spica out. It's not really all that common. This happened actually uh, earlier this year, uh, but it's not really all that common that the moon passes directly in front of a star as bright as spica. You got a first magnitude star, and so you're going to be able to watch that about 425 or 430, depending on where you are at a little bit different times. Um, you're going to watch the moon blink out spica and this beautiful crescent moon, and about an hour later, a little after 5.30 for me, it's probably 5.33 or 5.34 for me, the uh, spike is going to reappear on the other side of the moon as the moon slides across in front of it. That's probably the, coming out of occultation is probably the better thing for me to see. At 4.30 in the morning, uh, this is up over the horizon, but just barely up over the horizon, and so this is hard for me to see a little bit right here. This whole region I say rises is about 345. It depends on where, you know, early week, late week, and where you are exactly and how good your eastern horizon is. Uh, but for me, uh, it probably is more like 4 or 415 that I can see this well above the horizon. And by 430, it's there, but it's a little bit tricky. Um, so if, I, if I'm not going to watch the whole thing, I'm going to watch this come out the other side. But this is a don't miss opportunity, right? If you have a chance, 
in the morning to watch a big, bright, beautiful star that's one of our guide stars of spring, really. This tells us, see this coming up in the sky right now? It tells us spring is on the way, even though we're just getting into winter. Um, and so we see the, the moon block that out for, for an hour is, is a fabulous thing. And it's a beautiful crescent moon to be out there watching anyway. So, so that's what we got for you, everybody. We got, look, look to the west in the morning sky. And these are things you could have been watching all night long. And you got a, a bunch of good stuff to go out there to see. Look to the east and you see the stuff rising. And you're going to be rewarded with an occultation of a very bright star, Spica, on the morning of the 27th. So as always, everyone, thanks for watching, and we hope you have a great week of observing ahead, and keep watching the skies.